We're going to take on a subject that I'm absolutely fascinated with, and that is digital identity. So less than two months ago, former Labour and Conservative leaders Sir Tony Blair and Lord Haig called for everyone here in the United Kingdom to carry digital ID cards. So what is that going to mean for you, for me, for everybody else? Let's find out. Joining me now on stage are some experts in the field. Mark Little, Head of Identity Strategy in the UK and Ireland, get us all in the right chairs here. Uh, for LexisNexis Risk Solutions. We've got Matthew Peak, Global Director for, of Public Policy for Onfido. Sophie Winwood, Investment Principal at Anthemus Group, if I pronounced that correctly, well done. Uh, and Alex Tonello, Chief Revenue Officer at Fido. Now we're not going to confuse Onfido and Fido. We will be absolutely vigilant with that. Welcome. Also, message to the audience, we're going to have some time for audience Q&A, so get your questions ready, and I'm going, to, I'm going to look in a moment for my folks with microphones, but I'll get us started. Sophie, let's start with you. Um, you mentioned that you were more of the, the, um, the overall expert uh, or an investor in, in fintech, but I'd love to know how you see this idea of digital identity. How do you, in particular, define it? Yeah, absolutely. I, I definitely wouldn't class myself as an expert. These guys are definitely the expert. But um, I spend a lot of time looking at sort of the overall trends in fintech and, and specifically uh, digital identity with respect to consumers and also businesses. And I was just saying earlier, you know, I, I used to work for Innovate Finance. I was sitting, um, organizing the conference about seven years ago. And we were still talking about, we were talking about that topic here, which is like the future of digital identity. When is it going to crystallize and when is it going to come, you know, a part of our lives where it becomes easy, frictionless and, and kind of very effective for the, for the whole economy. And, and while we have seen some innovation in the space, you know, the, the guys on the stage here um, on Fido and Fido um, really making moves to, to kind of change it. I'm sure you've interacted with their products in your day to day life. We still haven't seen the innovation and the movement forward that we would have hoped for. And we're even further behind in the, in the kind of business verification as well. And that's kind of a space where I'm spending a bit of time. And so um, as much as I think it is, it is a massive key and unlock to a lot of future business models, it's just not moving at the pace that we would have hoped. Okay, not moving at the pace that we'd hoped. Alex, what do you make of that? And tell us a little bit about what you're doing in particular in Digital ID. Yeah, um, well, I kind of bring you a bit of international perspective, but I, uh, I used to live in the UK for many years, and I've moved back to Italy where I'm now, so I can kind of bring you both sides. But um, where, where I think I see the uh, challenges, well, you know, in the UK, we've, we've as, as Sophie said, we've sort of been trying and sort of positioned this for a long time. And then I go back to Italy, and i just doing an application for my daughter's school, and they asked me for digital identity, and I says, oh, wow, I didn't realize this was a thing, and go through and any, any kind of work. So I was kind of surprised that this, you know, you don't have to go into sort of some, some of the most innovative countries mm. to see this happening, uh, but it is, it is a thing, and uh, it's not the most frictionless journey. That, you know, this is one of the things that we have to appreciate is that consumer really want something that is easy and, and I think that's, that, that's the sort of the, the, the balance, isn't it? Having something that works but that doesn't impede the, the journey, doesn't sort of slow down and so on. But I think having seen both sides, uh, yeah, there's still a lot to do in, in mm. the UK. And tell us what you're doing in particular. And for us, I think our view is the, uh, you know, for digital identity, we have to look at the, uh, the sort of the, the idea that comes from a, from a user. Every every one of us consume apps, uh, web, um, and, and so on. And for us, it's about looking at the history of of, of how we consume these, mm -hmm. and therefore having a bit of a digital footprint sort of updates uh, when when we make uh, an application or so on. And for us, it's that that's, 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 that's the sort of flavor we bring in. And the idea is kind of to to uh, you know avoid the challenge of having something that really is an ID, but then you have problems with, with frauds 
and yeah. therefore you know bad actors trying to to, mm. to, to sort of prevent that so that, that's, that's that's the sort of thing okay we're we going to come back to fraud because that's still uh, an issue Matthew, why don't you give us a flavor of, of what you're doing in particular yep. and, and some of the places where we might have interacted with, with on Yeah, sure. So um, we use AI and biometric technologies to, in very simple terms, prove who you are, uh, if you are who you say you are online. Um, and we're providing that service to lots of businesses across fintech, crypto, financial services more generally, but also other use cases. And really, it's a technology which can be used by any company that wants to have a very clear idea of who they're their end customers are um, and you can layer it in different ways so we have a library of different signals active signals where you can check the validity of a passport for example facial biometrics where you can scan your head left to right and make sure that your biometrics match your passport um, but also passive signals as we call them so library uh, checks against databases for example or making sure the integrity of your mobile phone or your or your email is is valid um, and to your point, I mean, a lot of that is to do with preventing fraud, mm. right? If you think about the way that you often verify yourself online, it can be with a username and password. We just think that's, that's a sort of a dead proposition now, mm. right? That there are so many examples of where your username and password have been hacked. Um, and people storing that information, you have no idea who's storing it, where it's stored, who has access to it. Um, we need to come up with a far more joined up, user-friendly proposition where you can identify yourself to a really high level of assurance. So that's what we do. Okay, fantastic. Um, let's bring in Lexus Nexus uh, Risk Solutions as well. Mark, how are you? I'm very good, thank you. Good, excellent. So um, let's, well, let's dive into this issue of fraud. And I'd mm -hmm. love to hear how you in particular see it, um, which is within the context of how fast things move within this context of passwords are dead. But where do the risks? Passwords aren't dead. They're not. They're not dead. Okay. Take us. Take us through your thoughts. Um, I think probably uh, the the we want them to be dead, right? Yeah, we sure do. But um, all of us are still using them. Mm. Um, I think the phrase or the quote should be, passwords should be dead. Okay. Um, uh, and, so you got and a prediction for when we'll be moving to more of a digital identity version of passports? No. <laughs> All right. Um, so, um, not probably not a helpful uh, <laughs> prediction. Um, the the way the things that are actually going to drive that are if users can be persuaded to see value in digital identity, because it's not something that they wake up in the morning thinking about right. at the moment. Surprisingly enough, um, they a do lot in of India. Well, uh, if something is na is nationally mm. um, uh, leveraged as Aadhaar is, then then perhaps you use it every day. Right now, there is not the value at the point of need such that drives the UK population to say, I absolutely need uh, my own self-asserted you know, uh, user identity. Now, there are there, there's reasons for that. Um, the government could be a lot more helpful than they are at the moment. Uh, there's a lot of regulation that crosses over each other um, uh, and, and creates rather muddy waters uh, for businesses like us mm. on the supply side who want to get on with it, frankly. Uh, and I know, you know Matt said that before. Um, and that's not going to happen if uh, the regulation is unclear um, and if we try to build in new standards where there are already existing ones that we are all operating on. Interesting. Well, let's dive as well back, back keep with fraud for a moment before we turn to more optimistic uh, thoughts. Give us some examples of some of the fraud that you've seen, um, Alex, and, and what could be done to mitigate it? Yeah, so the, the problem with um, fraudsters um, is that you know we in the industry trying to innovate, but they are innovating at a much faster rate, um, and they are really early adopters when it comes to technology. And we've seen that with uh, AI now, with uh, the rise of uh, some of the things we've been talking about in, 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 in other of these talks today. But the, the, some examples are really even in countries where, and I've and, you know we've seen it in Italy, for example, but in other places where uh, a digital identity is. Is, is happening and there are providers that's, that's, that, that service that, that market. Uh, we've seen uh, fraudster uh, stealing identity, uh, passport, and, and, and documents and recreate that mm -hmm. sort, sort of process of onboarding a digital ID. Right. So once they've done that, then the game is done, right? You're able to, mm -hmm. you know, to act as, as, as the, the person you've stolen the, 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 mm -hmm. the ID from. Um, so, so 
that is the real examples of this happening, even in countries that are already there, already like sort India. of making that, that step towards a, um, a digital ID. So, well, what can you do about it? Well, I think there is, you know, many solutions out, out there, and I think the idea for, you know, we, we, we always say the story around leveraging alternative data, you know, solutions that like really... Like what? Tell us what the kinds of data so, you can see. You know, for us, it's, uh, it's about digital signals that, that are from, uh, you know, that can connect, connect an email address, for example, to, a, to an Amazon, a Google account, uh, to a LinkedIn account, a, a telephone number to a, to a WhatsApp account. These are things that, you know, you as a user have built because of you use your email, your phone number over years. Yeah. And of course, they cannot recreate that quickly because yeah. they need years in the making and they cannot do it in quantity or scale, yeah. right? So this is just one example of data that you can use. There are obviously others. And in leverage machine learning technologies and, mm -hmm. and scoring to predict and sort of say, actually, is this like to be a genuine person or is this someone that is Interesting. So it's a bit of a fault. Anything to add to that, Matthew? It's a massive problem. Mm -hmm. Fraud is a, and it's not getting any smaller. In fact, our data suggests we've seen a 40% year-on-year rise in the amount of fraud just on our systems alone since the pandemic. Wow. Um, there are some extremely clever fraudsters out there who are able to do deep fake technology, who are able to spoof passports to an incredible degree of accuracy. Um, and you know, to Alex's point, what we need to do is have the regulatory support to improve our technology to keep ahead of it. And it's really hard to do, but we need access to data. We want access to fraudulent examples of data, in fact, so we can understand how these nuances are occurring. Um, we've got a dedicated fraud lab within Onfido, and I'm sure you know, all of our other players in the market have got something similar because it is really, really hard to track this stuff. Mm. But exactly to your point, it's not just about verifying that, that one single signal. You need to have a, a library of different signals so you know whether someone is in the country where they purport to be from. Um, you can check against lots of different sources of truth to ensure that you've got that maximum level of assurance. But just one other thing, you know, if I'm hiring an e-scooter in London, I want a different level of friction if I, as opposed to if I'm opening a bank account. Yeah, or right? buying it's, a house. To, and, and you expect to have a different level of friction, frankly. Mm -hmm. If I was able to open a bank account just like that, you'd maybe be a bit worried that it was that easy to do so. Whereas if I hire an e-scooter, I don't want to give all my personal information away. Mm. So we need to have a layered approach to these things, depending on the appetite for risk. Interesting. Right, have we got our microphones around? And have we got some questions in the audience for my fantastic panel? Right, start thinking, because I'm going to come back to you in just a moment. Um, Sophie, let's hear from you. Where are you investing? Where do you think is the, the interesting area to invest in, in, the, in digital identity at the moment? Yeah, I think there are, there are two um, parts that we're diving into at the moment. Um, one is really around this business verification. Um, as, you know, as we've seen with the pandemic, huge shift of these undigital industries shifting online, um, a lot of B2B marketplaces um, and kind of traditionally undigital business models are now transacting online, which is great. Like whom? Um, so a, a great example is um, a comp uh, there's a big company called Anchor, Anchor Store, which is allowing um, shops and customers to buy the products that they would then go on to sell. So it's a wholesaler marketplace. Mm -hmm. Traditionally, you would go to a conference like this, you would meet some people, you would buy the products, um, you know, you'd see them, you look them in the face, and you'd be like, yeah, okay, can feel the product in my hands. Now this is going online, more efficient, cheaper, easier, a lot bigger catalog, but actually how can you verify that underlying business is who they say they are, mm. that they have the products they, they have. Obviously that is putting a big break on that business model taking off. And so there are different parts to kind of the business verification as well. Is the business who they say they are? Do they have the insurance they need? Um, you know, uh, what is the businesses that they interact with down the line? A lot more complex, but, but if you solve that problem, you are really kind of, kind of gonna see a lot of these industries kind of moving a lot quicker. I think that's really interesting. Mm -hmm. The second thing I think in on the consumer side is really kind of what is identity? Um, you know, traditionally it was your passport and where you lived, but that is evolving so much in this digital age with digital nomads, with the de different data points you can get in terms of social, where you work. And so kind of how you rethink what, what identity actually means and then apply that to consumer is quite interesting as well. Interesting. Right, have we got any questions from the audience? Yes, we've got one just here. Can we get a microphone? 
She's leaping to action, second row. Well done, thank you. And just introduce yourself and a brief question. Thank you. <coughs> Can we turn the microphone up, please? Try again. Hello. No. Nope. Keep, keep, keep speaking. Hello. One, two, three. There yes. we go. Okay. On you go. All right. So this is Peter from Amplify Capital. Thank you very much. I'm actually familiar with some of the services they are using, some of them now, and looked at some of the other ones before. But these are all kind of business-led. Uh, uh, so when we want to evaluate the customer, we pay for them, and we, with their, um, with their uh, agreement we can actually uh, check the passports that they send us and so on but um, I was wondering if anybody thought about the other way around where the customer can create their own identity which they pre-create and it's in their possession and then they can actually present it and um, normally in countries when there are IDs obviously state owned mm. IDs then that can basically be used a bit more here it's a bit difficult in the UK because there's no ID, um, but perhaps there could be some commercial style ID, okay. which would be in the possession of the customer. Has anybody thought about it? And could government perhaps Great. help? Okay, well, let's hear from Mark and then um, also from I, Mark. I think uh, the, they're quite quiet, the digital identities you're talking about. They do exist. Um, there are many companies, uh, uh, Digidentity, uh, Yoti, One ID. OBID, there's an open banking, there was open banking on earlier, so open banking ID as well. So there are a number of, actually of existing companies um, that produce uh, reusable identities. Um, uh, you know, there's a lot of companies that produce single-use identities, like uh, a, a, lot of, uh, uh, a lot of this panel. Um, but there are self-asserted reusable digital identities available on the market now. Um, so that is something that, that exists. The problem is the adoption uh, of them by consumers. Uh, the mainstream haven't seen them yet, don't understand them, can't see the value in them yet. And that's why, as I said before, I think that we need to be able to have these identities, but they need to have very clear perceived value and enough value, you might even call it everyday value, uh, for them to actually adopt it because if the businesses don't see the users adopting it, the businesses are not about to switch and change their structures um, and their systems unless they see a large quantity of consumers um, adopting those reusable identities. Okay. And maybe to add on, on that, yeah. uh, I think, uh, and I guess if I got the question as well, you're also trying to think about what, what, what if you empower the, the consumers to, to hold a wallet of an ID themselves, and then you, they own that, and they, they, they effectively have that, but, but they, they are in control, full control of that. And there are some companies that I know that have, have been trying to go down that direction, but I think it's going back to, the, to this adoption. You know, to get scale, mm -hmm. you need to have a lot of consumers to be part of these pools, and there is a bit of a trade-off that you need to achieve Consumers need to sort of want okay, to do so that. Okay, so chicken and egg, right. And, then, and the idea is that most consumers are not bothered, and this is hard to get that sort of a big, big scale and, and, and adoption. I, I think it can only work if there's some kind of monopoly, because there has to be only, like, there has to be one ID that everybody then uses, because... Okay, just one ID. Yeah. Hold, hold that thought. Matthew, did you I, have something I don't, to I mean, add? I, I totally agree with what, with what Mark Hayek said. I mean, it, for me, it's about user empowerment. Right. I mean, if you if you think about the use case and the value prop for a, for an end user, I would love to have a, an ID that I can open my bank account with, but then I can go and access Facebook if I went on Facebook, you know, or, or I went to hire a scooter or whatever it is, or hire a car. That reusability is a huge value proposition if you think about it as a user, because it massively reduces the friction of doing lots of different use cases. Is that easy to do? No, very difficult, because there are different standards. There are different regulators that regulate all these different sectors, right. and there's a lot of friction. So that's what we need to solve, but I do think there's a, a huge value there, okay. ultimately. Thank you. Is there another question from the audience? We're running very close. On. Yes, just here. Thank you. Hey, I'm Adriana Credit Suisse. So I believe in digital identity is fundamental to innovation, to everything, cybersecurity, anti-money laundering, everything without it. But I also believe that it has to be globally interoperable at some point. And we've been pushing for that. And if you look at financial inclusion, mm. if you look at anything else, we are a digital society. So just having something that works within the UK, or even within Europe, I think within Europe would be ideal to start with. But how, do you see that happening? Any, I mean, I'm told 
Probably not for the next 10 years, but do you see that happening at all? Maybe sooner, which is what I'm hoping well, for. Of course, India is already doing it with the UAE and with Singapore. Right. So right. are we falling behind in the UK? Yeah. Well, I, I think that, I mean, obviously one of the objectives of the Digital Identity and Attributes Trust Framework is to be interoperable. The key thing to be interoperable with are your key trading partners you know, where you do most of your digital economy. So, yes, we must, must drive towards interoperability um, and prioritise that interoperability with our biggest trading partners. So, yes, throw in EU probably and EIDAS is probably the first framework that we need to really make sure uh, that our trust framework is interoperable with. So I think we have something already that we're working on with Singapore and then there's also something yeah. with Canada. So, yeah. I mean, it's starting, but it's just, there's still friction. Perfect. We're yeah. running out of time. Who's got something burning that they'd like to add? No? Yes. Come on, Matthew. I can well, see Well, and what I was going to say on the interoperability point is just very slow. It's like to your point about 10 years, it probably will take that long. Um, we need to take the politics out of it, yeah. frankly, um, and we need to do it in a way which is going to encourage these sort of things to innovate quickly. Um, and so. I, I, think the, I think the other thing that um, we need to be aware of is, uh, is big tech just swooping in and creating a digital wallet which, due to their penetration, allows them to create close to a monopoly like they tend mm. to um, moving forward. Um, but that um, we wouldn't advise necessarily uh, consumers always to, to trust them doing that. Um, that's why there are initiatives and programs that have uh, emerged recently. Uh, the Open Wallet Foundation uh, is, is based on Linux and is trying to develop um, uh, identity wallets which will allow um, other options, other routes for developing this, this uh, self-asserted reusable identity other than um, your Apple digital wallet, for example. Um, uh, so that is all starting to move. Um, and obviously, the Digital Identity and Attributes Trust Framework is meant to make that easier to do. Great, thank you so much. Right, we've run out of time for this panel, but let's give a huge round of applause to Mark, Matthew, Sophie, and Alex.